Rejoice to see you this morning. We trust that our time together will benefit your spiritual encouragement and development, that we will be able to share not only the message of the cross, but be able to share in great fellowship together. Fifth Sunday, if you're visiting with us and you didn't know it was Fifth Sunday at College Hill, you're in luck because we have potluck immediately after worship this morning and we've got some great cooks at College Hill. And we uh, look forward to sharing that meal together. There's going to be plenty of food. I want you to stay and, and be with us and to enjoy uh, this time together. We've uh, been discussing for the last several weeks uh, uh, a subject that is timeless in nature. It's one that uh, is constantly being used and alluded to. Uh, last week we talked about being salt. Uh, Jesus had just finished telling them uh, how you're filled with the fullness of God. And so he told them to be poor in spirit, etc. And, and as Jesus talked about these things, he said, Blessed are you when these are a part of your life. And then he looks at his disciples, and I imagine that they probably didn't understand the intensity of the words that Jesus spoke, but he looks them straight in the eye and he says, You're the salt of the earth. You're the salt of the earth. And last week we talked about us as being salt. We said that this is a description of our work of influence in the world in which we live. But then Jesus doesn't stop there. He goes on and he speaks words which are most familiar to us. He says to us, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. You and I, when we follow after Jesus, are being called salt for the influence, but then we're being called light because light is that which illumines. Isn't that a beautiful picture up there? It's an incredibly beautiful picture. You're saying to me, Robert, there's just a white line around the page that kind of looks like a frame and I don't see anything. That's right. But that's what this world is like if those who claim to be Christ don't project and fulfill their role. That's what life is like. It's nothing but darkness. But it doesn't take much to make a difference. All we have to have is one light among many. And we suddenly begin to see the world in a whole different perspective. We begin to see that the message of the cross, the message of the Christ becomes viable to a great quantity of people. The problem in our world today is that Christians and those who have the light of the gospel may not be shining forth in such a way that people can see the message. But you and I have that responsibility. Jesus says, this is what you are. You're, you're not just salt which influences, which flavors and preserves and all of those sort of things, but you're light and your task is light is to illumine and to make sure that people can see my message. God has already given us the light. Notice what the psalmist says in Psalms 112 verse 4, light arises in the darkness for the upright. In the midst of, of, of the most bleak of circumstances in life, those who are in Christ Jesus, those who have submitted themselves to the way of the cross, they find themselves able to be light. Because God has shined light within us. Remember how many times Jesus in the gospel message talks about his role in this world of being light? In John chapter 9 verse 5, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world, Jesus says. While he was here, he was impacting people daily. Because they would look at Jesus and they would see what he did and see how he talked and, and see how he responded to the people around them. 
and they would come to understand that he was different. And those who really understood his difference were willing to be responsive to him and they in turn would become his disciple. And as his disciple, they would be light. Because light's task is to illumine and Jesus illumined this world. brought it bigger. And his challenge to us is for us to be the light of the world. To be like the city that is set on the hill. We don't light the lamp and we don't put it under a lampshade that completely closes off the light, but we put it on a lampstand so that it will give light to all who come in contact with it. That's our task. Listen to Paul as he talks to the church at Rome, beginning in chapter 13, verse 12. The night is almost gone, Paul says. The day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Jesus, in Matthew 5, says, you are the light. Paul says, we need to make sure that we're being the light. Paul says we need to make sure that we're trying to accomplish God's task in a very turmoil-filled, troublesome world. I don't know if you've ever been at, at a scene like this. I have several times in my life. And, and you saw the ominous clouds and you saw what was coming towards you, and, but yet there was always some light there to the edge and you said as long as there's light, there's hope. It was always a great comfort. You and I are to be those who, who project the light of Christ in this world so that the world can tell that there's hope, that there's something that is going to give them the ability to walk and to survive and to succeed, and yes, even to become Christ, because there's light being demonstrated around them in the lives of people who are living for Christ. So the light of God shines down upon us at all times. This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you. God is light. And in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all unrighteousness or from all sin. Light. Light. Have you ever been without light? I mean, totally without light? Every now and then when I'm over teaching at the school in Donetsk, the, the lights in that section of town will go off for a little while. This last year, a friend of mine gave me a very small flashlight, a very nice but flashlight, but a very small flashlight. And, and I woke up in the middle of the night and I noticed, hmm, the electricity's off. It was dark. I mean, the bedroom in the apartment is kind of in a cave anyway. And so I reached over and felt for and found that little light and turned it on. I said, ah, I can see. Didn't take much. Didn't take much. Why? Because a little light makes a tremendous difference in the world in which you and I live. God is the light of the world. And he projects that light to all. And if you and I will walk in the light, we can make a difference in the lives of people that we come in contact with. For you were formerly darkness, Paul says, but now you're light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. That's our admonition. Walk as children of light. You were in darkness. You were in sin. You were, you, were, you were controlled by Satan. But yet now you've come to Christ. And when you come to Christ, all things have changed. You become different. What about that light that we are? 
Well, what, what sort of dynamic is involved in that light? Well, he says in verse 9, for the fruit of light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth. You see, in contrast to the, the evil, in contrast to the sin, and in contrast to the debauchery of this world, God says, I want you to understand that, that the, the fruit of the light, the fruit of you being light in this world is, is wrapped up in goodness. Goodness. I was visiting with an individual some months ago that I had known in years past, and we were talking about a mutual acquaintance, and he looked at me and said concerning our mutual acquaintance, you know, of all the people I know, he was really a good person. I thought, you know, that's, that's what I want on my epitaph. <laughs> Filled with goodness. The word goodness comes from the word godliness, the concept of being like God. Being one who, who exudes to the world around them the difference and works diligently to make the difference in their life. And he says righteousness. In, in, in contrast to the teaching of our world, the world says, oh, you can just kind of live like you want to, be like you want to, act like you want to. But the truth of the matter is there is a right and there is a wrong. And as I read my Bible, God has established that which is right and God has established that which is wrong. And you and I need to stop and think, okay, am I going to be a, a person who lives in that which is right, in the righteousness of God? That's the fruit of light. And then he says it's also bound up in truth. This, this world in which we live is arguing with us about is there anything called truth? Is truth totally subjective? What, what's true to you is not true to me. What's true to me is not true to you. No, friend, I tell you, Jesus makes it clear. He says, I am the truth. I am the truth. I'm not just the giver of truth. I am the truth. And when you, you stop and look at me as the truth, you come to understand that there is an absolute standard. And that standard, when it's demonstrated in the world in which we live, projects the light, the light that God has for us. Then in verse 13, but all things become visible when they are exposed by the light, for everything that becomes visible is light. You see, our task here upon this earth is to demonstrate to this world in such a way that they see Christ flowing through us and being demonstrated to them so that they will want in their life to be light. But then comes the real question, how does the Christian illumine this world? How does the Christian illumine this world? You know, this is going to be the simplest of answers that you've ever heard. Because the bottom line is, we illumine this world by illustrating Jesus and his character to all that is around. And so you get up in the morning and you look at the members of your family, if you live by yourself, I know you won't be doing that, but if you live in a family, you, you look at the members of your family. Are you light to them? You know, someone asked Sue recently, said, do you wake up grumpy in the morning? She says, no, I let him sleep. <laughs> do you illuminate to your family? You get up and you, you, you start heading to work. You know, every now and then I, I, I get up early and go meet my son to pick up uh, one of our grandchildren and bring them back for Mama Sue to keep. And so I'm rolling down the road at 5.45 or 6 o'clock and, and that traffic sometimes is not too bad. And I'll notice when there's a lot of space between cars, people seem to be nice and friendly. But every now and then, especially on 183, boy, it gets, it gets real tedious. And I'll be driving down the road and I'll say, some of these people need light. Some of these people need light. You know, you get to the job, you get to school. And this is really a cat kicking world in which we live. And, and, and everybody's kind of dog eat dog. 
and, and, and people are mean, and, and how do you respond? How do you illustrate Jesus? You go to the store, how do you illustrate Jesus? You go to a place of entertainment, you go to a sporting event, how do you illustrate Jesus to the people that are around you? I want to suggest some things that I think we all need to stop and think about. Nothing new, totally reminders. Very simplistic. Number one, how do you talk? How do you talk? I was reminded the other day when I was talking with someone about prescriptions and everything when I had a bad experience with a mail order prescription house and I wasn't nice to the guy when I tried to correct the problem. Confess, I wasn't. And he punished me. He sent me a double order of the stuff I didn't need. I thought about that a lot over the years. That's been quite a few years ago. And so the other day I was having a little bit of difficulty along the same line and I just dripped with sweetness I let my speech be with grace as though seasoned with salt. Problem solved. Prescription right. It was, it was just such a different world. Sometimes a cashier will give you the wrong change. I was behind a man recently that, I mean, he just really snapped at the gal. And, and she made it right and she got it solved, but he still was in the kickative mood. And lo and behold, I came up and she, she was so rattled, she made a mistake. And she knew that I was fixing to unload on her. And I said, let's take our time and I bet we can figure this out without much difficulty. And I smiled at her. I made a friend for life. How do you talk? When you're out away from your brothers and sisters in Christ and maybe you're on the job site, how do you talk? How, how do you respond to the people that you come in contact? Are, are you light? Are you light? How do you dress? How do you dress? Sometimes people will dress so nicely for church, worship, but then they won't dress in a way that befits Christ when they get away from there. Sometimes people come to worship in a tire that, that really a Christian should not be in. Slogans on shirts, apparel that doesn't befit Christ Jesus. How do you dress? How do you dress? There's, there's one verse that's given to women, but I believe it applies to men, quite honestly. I believe it applies to any person who's trying to live a godly life and to be light in this world. First Timothy chapter two, likewise I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, modestly, discreetly, let the means of good works as is proper for women making a claim to godliness. Do you dress in such a way that you attract them to the cross? You attract them to Jesus? Or do you dress in such a way that you create lustful thoughts? or wrong images and wrong ideas. How do you dress? How do you do your task in your secular employment? I've said this many times and it's happened several times in recent times, recent months. Run into someone and we were talking for whatever reason and and they say, oh, I work at so-and-so. That's generally the question that you ask. And I say, oh. And then I think, ooh, do I want to ask them if they know such and such and so-and-so? 
And usually you're already past the point of no return. So you say, oh, do you know? And you call out a name. And then I stand there with my breath held. I wonder what they're going to, to say. Man, it's a joy when they say, wow, he, he's a good employee. You know, he really works hard and he really helps all of us. And, and he kind of keeps it in, in the office where people don't use the, the wrong language and they don't tell the wrong jokes and all of those sort of things. He, he, he's a light. He, he's demonstrating Jesus to us. Sometimes, occasionally, we see just the opposite. How do you do your task in secular employment? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 11, Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, Paul says. Attend to your own business. Work with your hands, just as we commanded you, so that you will behave properly toward outsiders and not be in any need. He says you take care of things. It's only been a, a couple of months ago that I told you the story about the young man who was driving a preacher across the way. And as he passed the factory where he worked, he says, you see that building back there? You remember the illustration? And he says, I am the only Christian in that building. I'm the only one on that floor that represents Christ. He says, if I don't represent Christ, the church is not represented. Christ is not represented. That's the attitude that you and I need to have in our lives. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 23, whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men. You see, you may be getting your paycheck from Lockheed Corporation or Bell Helicopter or someplace else. But when you show up at the job, you're Christ. You're representing Him. Are you light? Are you light on the job? How do you think? It, this is my hardest battleground. Thinking one way when I ought to be thinking another way. Brethren, do not be children in your thinking, yet in evil be infants, but in your thinking be mature. Let the, the newness of Christ work within you. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Do you think about good things, right things, holy things, righteous things? I've told you about the little book, Practicing the Presence of God, Closer Than a Brother in its translation, in which the fellow came to the conclusion that he could worship God anywhere because he was so connected with God. God was in the forefront of his mind. And when he had to concentrate on other things, God was still in the forefront of his mind. He was constantly thinking about his relationship with God. How do you think? How do you think? We have the mind of Christ, Paul tells us. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16. We need to make sure we're exercising the mind of Christ. How do we let our light shine? Pretty simple. And when we think... And when we talk, and when we assume our tasks in such a way that they glorify God, the world knows. And they see the difference. And they want to be like the difference is. And how do you act? How do you act? I was at the ball game the other night, and chose to sit kind of away and there's a group of kids who were acting like a group of kids and I thought oh my I hope I didn't act that way when I was that age I'm afraid I did well I suppose they were just having fun enjoying themselves going to the mall and you see people acting out and acting disrespectfully. I'm not really much into Dallas city politics, but there's one thing I like about what Wayne Carraway stands for and on the city council, he doesn't want the pants dragging the ground. He doesn't want the underwear exposed. Now that gets back to how are you dressed, but it also is right here, how are you acting? 
How are you acting? Respectfully? Are you acting in such a way that people would think more about Christ than they would think about evil and Satan? Those sort of things. Conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders. Make the most of the opportunity. Make the most of the opportunity. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 12, keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may be cause of your good deeds as they observe them glorify God in the day of visitation. How do you act? How do you act? Well, Jesus puts a summary cap on top of all of this. He says, this is what you do. You let your light shine before men. How do you let your light shine before men? Well, in the way you talk and in the way you act and the way you think and the way you dress, the way in which you do your job and assume your responsibilities, that's the way you let your light shine before men. And you do it in such a way that they may see your good works. But because of the humility and submissiveness of heart that you have, they glorify your Father who is in heaven. You become Christ. You become Christ. And you demonstrate Christ to the whole world. That's our task, our role. Question. Can you let your light shine? If you're not in Christ, you can't. You need to be in Christ. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, except you believe that I am He, you shall die in your sins? John 8, 24. Have you turned from sin and, and turned toward God? Turned toward God in such a way that you are indicating righteousness in your life, that you've turned from the evil and the sin? Have you been immersed with Him? All your sins washed away. That point being able to be raised to walk in newness of life. And then are you walking? Are you walking in the light and are you being the light in the world that is around you? We extend an invitation. If you need to respond to Christ this morning, would you come? While together we stand and while we sing this song.